Great. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome this afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, um, you might be wondering, you know, who we are, the National Federation of Maldivian Employers, a new entity into the picture, right? Um, I'll just I'll just have a small brief about who we are, and then uh, we'll introduce our panelists today. So, the National Federation of Maldivian Employers was registered in 2018 um, as a as the first federation um, uh, in the Maldives in you know representing uh, various industries. Um, so we have uh, uh, six founders, and um, part of it are tourism associations, including. Um, uh, the National Boarding Association, the Yachting Association, and the Travel Agent. So, plus we have the Maldives Seafood Processing Association, we have the Restaurant Association, Maldives the Construction Association. So, the intention of this uh, federation was to um, establish a tripartite dialogue uh, system that ILO promotes, the International Labour Organization. So, um, ILO is recognized as uh, one of the partners in the Maldives when it comes to the tripartite concept. So um, on the on one side would be the employees representative and an employers represent and the government. So the whole concept was to establish this you know industrial relations and uh, when there's you know any issue that the dialogue the concept of dialogue is uh, the the option to choose. So we have been working and uh, under the COVID-19 situation, um, I thought that uh, we thought our board thought that it would be very good to start a dialogue to understand, you know, what are the challenges and possible solutions and uh, each, you know, each industry has. And so we, we try to find uh, a, a good concept, how to, you know, conduct these uh, episodes. So our board came up with this very nice, you know, idea that tailoring, tailoring a new reality, employer's dialogue. So uh, this would be six editions initially. Uh, which would cover the main industries, including logistics, um, construction, um, uh, fisheries, restaurants, food and beverage. You know? so, so the first ep episode today is about uh, travel and tourism. Uh, and the topic for today is safe reopening and reviving of the Maldives uh, travel and tourism. I'm honored to have and privileged to have uh, some of the best minds in the travel and tourism industry in the Maldives. Um, we also had uh, one of our colleagues join him, but, uh, Toyib, but he had to uh, run to an urgent meeting uh, uh, with the Ministry of Tourism. So I, I will try to give a very brief introduction about our panelists and uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Out of your busy schedules, you, uh, uh, you know, you wanted to spend this 90 minutes with us. And at the end of the discussion, uh, we'll try to fix uh, 60 minutes uh, for our discussion and open about 30 minutes for Q&A. And at the end of the session, we will try to compile the report and then share with the stakeholder ministers and the president uh, what we discussed today as a small report. And um, so um, I have uh, Mr. Abdullah Riaz Riaz, the uh, partner face of Future 2018 and the chair of Partner Maldives chapter. My friend, he is the former president of the Maldives Association of Travel Agents and also the current vice president. He's an entrepreneur in leading travel and startup businesses, director of Inner Maldives, Ace Travels, Spence Maldives, and Universal Aviation Maldives, and Margarita. I have my, uh, you know, I was partner to Sonu and friend, longtime friend, Mr. Sonu Shiv Dasani, is the co-founder of the world famous Soniva, operates uh, and resorts in the Maldives and internationally. Uh, I think uh, Sonu is the man who brought luxury tourism to the Maldives when you know, things were different in this country over 25 years ago. He has been observing the Maldives tourism situation and writing articles that are very relevant to today's dialogue and his ideas will no doubt help us pave the way, uh, way forward to start the, uh, restart the Maldives tourism. I mean, I don't think we need a further introduction on Sonu. We all know uh, what Sonu has done for this country and uh, tourism as a whole. Um, but for you, uh, he missed. I, I have, next I have Mr. Khalil, Mr. Mohammed Khalil. Is the, uh, he wants to be identified today as the CEO of Manta Air. He has so many portfolios, but you know, he's joining us uh, as an industry expert, but mostly as the CEO of Manta and brings 20 years of industry's experience with him. He's also actively engaged in uh, and overseeing the sales and marketing function of uh, Kandima Maldives. His experience of tourism and aviation is critical for our dialogue as well. 
Um, finally, we have uh, Mr. Murad Hassan. Mr. Murad is currently the Director of Business Development at Pillar Hotels and has an experience in world famous booking platform Agoda. He's, he's worked in Agoda for the last nine years and he was Head of Business Development of Agoda in the United Arab Emirates, Singapore, and Malaysia. Uh, now let's start the, the series. All right. So I will uh, conduct this session by um, asking questions from the panelists. Uh, I have, uh, you know, we opened up for sending us uh, questions. So it's a combination of um, our own, uh, you know, federations. Uh, we had a team, you know, pre preparing us for this day. So it, it's through this panel of experts and also from the public, uh, the, the questions were, uh, you know, compiled. So let's start with um, Mr. Diaz at, at uh, as the you know first person to start today. Um, I'll, I'll just put forward the first question to you, Diaz. You ready? Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. We are going through a transformative period, and every destination will need to recreate its tourism from the ground up. What should be the important steps of recovery and resolution? That's our first question. Yeah, I think, uh, see, if we are talking about um, um, recovery and resolution, I think it is very important that we talk about uh, where we've come or where we are at right now, uh, because this eagerness to go back to this old normal in everyone's in, in a rush to go back to the old normal, uh, I think not realizing that there were so many things that was not even right about that normal in the past. So I think when we talk about recovery, I think this is it's a good opportunity to be talking about that as well. Now in the Maldivian context, uh, let's say in 2019, we had uh, 1.7 uh, million tourists with an average stay of uh, 6.3 days. Now, given our bed capacity of uh, 52,199 beds, uh, in contrast to the, to, the, to the average stay, I think Maldives has a capacity of uh, 3 million tourists a year if we were to fill all the hotels, all the beds throughout the year. Now, it's a different um, uh, uh, debate whether it's a sustainable thing or whether we have the infrastructure or resources. But if you look at last year's figures, that is about 56% of our inventory throughout the year with that 1.7 million we were able to fill. Uh, so going forward, I think it's important that we rethink how we are going to fill these beds uh, and what are we doing so far about it. Um, taking again into context our uh, 48 years of history in tourism, where we are at this journey. Uh, and I think it's also very important that uh, uh, we have uh, the government and the private sector coming together and working on this uh, recovery plans, um, whether it is how we are going to return the businesses and economic uh, activities and also the guidelines and SOPs, I think, need to be uh, more clear and comprehensive. There needs to be uh, processes uh, that needs to be scrutinized in, on, a, on a micro to a macro level and also understand that these are feasible and practical. Uh, there needs to be uh, frameworks, frameworks created and building blocks that also demystify the rationale behind them each measure. And I don't think we are seeing that done in the best manner that we could do it. Uh, even in terms of marketing the destination, I think uh, in comparison to what the Maldives is, there's far, far more better things that we can be doing and we need to be doing, especially if we want to talk about recovery and for recovery to come to Maldives that depends, I think, on tourism, which has the highest uh, dependency uh, if you look at our uh, GDP. Um, and lastly, I would say, um, we also, I think, need to understand more how the lives of the common Maldivian can be enriched more by this sector. Are they better off every year with the growth of this sector? Are uh, the dollars trickle down fairly? Uh, is, there better, is there a better way of, uh, of uh, distribution or can we bridge the inequality in a better way? I think we are getting a chance to not really start from ground up simply because there is so much appetite for Maldives right now. And I think uh, uh, the whole world is dreaming about Maldives and eager to come back to Maldives. But this also gives us an opportunity uh, to correct the mistakes of our past and really restart it with a whole reset uh, and really regenerate our tourism in a more uh, beneficial way to everybody. Yeah. 
um, the whole um, concept of this employees dialogue is to see how you know um, we can come out how we can come out the whole concept of this dialogue is how we can come out of the situation better and um, also uh, looking at the local situation uh, we are we are representing the, the the key industries of the country and we want to create that situation where more locals uh, get engaged in the economic activities of the country so that is the whole purpose of these dialogues you know where our youth you know can have uh, better opportunities so we come out uh, you know, we are learning the, the uh, uh, new lesson the hard way. So when, when we come out, we come out, in, you know, uh, with practical steps to make a difference. You know, not keep doing the same thing that we were doing before. The, before what has happened. Sonu, my second question is to Mr. Sonu, and um, Sonu, you there? Sonu. I think there is a, a connection problem with Mr. Sonu, so maybe we can move on with another panelist and I will... Okay, all right. All right. Um, till Sonu is back, um, I will try to um, forward the um, uh, next question to our panelist, uh, Mr. Khalil. Uh, Khalil, my question to you would be, um, how can we implement uh, the measures, uh, the WHO and the Ministry of Tourism guidelines in ways that minimize um unnecessary impact on international travel and trade um you know what, what would be the impact on these guidelines and how we're going to face the new situation um especially uh, follow so I, I was watching a program today and uh, in some countries they're appointing in some airlines they're appointing um clinical officers you know uh to to manage uh, uh, the health aspect of it so it's a new it's a new position you know they, they're, they're putting clinical officers in, in, in their respective airports and um, on airlines. So let's hear from you, you know, what do you think about, uh, you know, getting I used think, to this new situation? Yeah, I think uh, guidelines are quite broad and has provided the basis for individual countries to formulate their own SOPs in such a way that it is practically possible to implement. We should always look at practicality when it comes to having different regulations and SOPs prepared. We must ensure that the guideline really doesn't make us more, you know, painful and waste the resources and cost us a huge amount of money. There are many countries actually who are making uh, that this is practically possible to do. I think I have seen the revised, uh, the SOP that is basically done by MOT, but still they are insisting to carry a PCR test on every individual tourist that is coming to the country, which is practically impossible to do. Having PCR test is not practical solution at this moment. Most countries, you know, that are struggling even to get this PCR test done on individuals. And they are adapting basically to do the PCR test on, only on people who has got uh, symptoms. There is a scarcity basically of uh, the test kits available across the globe. Every country is basically struggling to get the test kits and the machines and no country in the world will be able to provide uh, the test for every their citizens. So we will have to question ourselves whether it's practically possible for us to make every tourist to do the test and arrival and carry a test certificate, uh, which I don't think it is practically possible. If we make this compulsory, then we may have to prepare for an extremely slow recovery than anticipated until the vaccine basically gets developed. I would basically suggest instead of doing this kind of uh, 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 compulsory things, which are not really practical to perform, rather practice to have a safe distance have uh, in, introduced a hand sanitizer and wearing face mask, and then making uh, implement a body temperature through thermal cameras on area. Well, that will be quite sufficient for us. You see, the people who is going to travel to Maldives would have already have gone through this screening process at their home country borders. So we are doing a secondary test at here in Maldives. By the time they reach here, the we would they would basically be fully aware whether they have got these symptoms or not. 
you know, even in the in the new SOP, it's basically making making it compulsory for to wear the hazimut and start and treat every passenger as a COVID positive. That actually will discourage the tourists visiting Maldives rather than encouraging them. I think it will basically will give a very kind of an unwelcoming message which will harm actually our industry and recovery process. Thank you very much, Khalil. I think um, this, um, this uh, uh, response from you also relates to a question that is coming to the panelists from one of the participants which says, what best practice measures will be taken in resorts to mitigate the risk in the initial phase of the opening? We'll come back to that. Um, but I think uh, that you had a fair, you know, practical judgment on the situation. Um, let's elaborate on that uh, after hearing from others. Sonu, uh, we missed you a bit. <laughs> uh, welcome back. Um, I have um, the next question to you. You there? Yes, yes I am. Sorry, my internet went. So I, I'm just now using my phone. Um, oh, okay. Get either 4G on my laptop or the internet, right. which is bit of a pain. Hopefully you'll come back. As soon no, as no, but, come. But, but you're good. We can see you. It's, it's really nice. <laughs> we can hear you well. All right. So, okay. The, my first question to you would be um, the Asian Devel Development Bank estimates uh, uh, the revenues uh, to the Maldives tourism would decline in the best case scenario by 1.8% of gross domestic product, which corresponds to 98 million in the best case. Worst case, over $300 million. We still don't know how, how much that number could be, right? Considering this, um, the ADB's estimate and the international financial, other financial estimates, um, that is, uh, uh, considering the borders will open in the upcoming two months, based on yeah. this, how long would an average resort take to recover from the loss and back, get back to the normal business? Can we get back to normal business anytime soon? Oh, you know, how are we looking at? Is it for six months from now? Is it one year from now? You know, how, how are we going to plan this? You know, how, how would the results? We all have our individual judgments. There are a lot of reports being written. I know we don't have a definite answer, but I think um, considering the experts around the world, you want your best place, you know, to, to advise us on, on this situation, especially the Maldives and our region. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I would say, um, I think the situation is very fluid at the moment, and um, it really changes by the day or the week um, in terms of the situation. And so um, we've had some very good news recently, which is the government launching its tourism guidelines, uh, giving a clear date when borders will open. So I think that's all been fantastic. Um, but that's just one step in the road to recovery. Um, the other steps, of course, are um, so, so the other steps, of course, are firstly demand from clients. So what we've seen, our experience is, and I've, I've seen this uh, because I'm quite close to sales in our organization and I'm regularly in touch with some of our travel partners and our sales offices. And what I have seen is a considerable amount of demand. So that's the next step is clients wanting to travel. And um, to give you an idea, the first 18 days of May, we had about 19, 90 leads, 90 leads for the two Sunevas in the Maldives, um, including Suneva Kiri as well in Thailand for the three properties. Uh, between the 18th and the 25th of May, we had another 90 leads. So in seven days, we had the equivalent of what we had in the first 18 days. Uh, last weekend, we saw 30 leads, which is a record for a week, even in pre-COVID time. So there is definitely interest. Uh, from people traveling, the demands there. And then the question is the ability. Um, so, and what we're seeing is that demand is coming for uh, uh, dates out. So we're, we're looking at October, uh, January um, 2021. There's some demand for July and August. And then the next question, of course, is ability. Can people travel? So if they want to travel, because they've been cooped up the last two to three months uh, in lockdown, um, can they travel? Um, and um, and, and that the ability to travel is changing by the day. So we're uncertain as to uh, what will happen there. And the two aspects of ability is one, flights coming in, and the second is governments allowing countries to travel. So my view is, I'm always a little optimistic, is my view is, is that 
as the weeks and the days go by, uh, you will see more good news in that area. So you'll see more airlines resuming flights sooner than planned. So at the moment, um, the borders open 1st July. I believe the Middle East airlines are talking about resuming flights around the 7th of July. I think those are the first bookings you have from Qatar and Emirates if you want to book a flight into the Maldives. It's around the 7th of July. Uh, there are some airlines like Go. I was speaking with the CEO of Go in India. Um, they're not restarting until October. Um, I understand that British Airways has no plans to restart in the immediate future. Let's hope that that happens by November. So um, not all airlines will restart immediately, and it'll, it'll take a bit of effort. Um, uh, we as a country, we as the travel industry, um, tour operators, travel agents, um, hoteliers, we need to try and solicit the airlines and encourage them. Um, work with our partners in the other markets to perhaps underwrite seats, um, get the government to support airlines uh, by giving them subsidies to come into the Maldives. So making it competitive to land in the Maldives than elsewhere. In the past, it was quite expensive to land in Mali compared with other destinations. You also had the issue about traffic. So, you know, um, I, I remember I, I used to take the 10 in the morning flight, Qatar flight, and I'd always miss my connection because um, you, you, the, the plane would sort of be about half an hour late, it'd be hovering for an hour, it would then land and it would take time to take off again. So um, sorting those out and making um, Mali an attractive place for planes to land is gonna be essential. And then reaching out to these airlines and encouraging them to accelerate their restart date is gonna be important because I, I have no doubt there'll be the demand. I've already seen the demand, as I mentioned, you know, some record pre-COVID numbers of uh, leads coming in. But in the short term, we need the flights. And then the other one is the governments. We need governments uh, abroad to make um, the conditions of traveling abroad less onerous. So for example, at the moment, if you return to the UK as a citizen, you have to quarantine for 14 days. So no one's gonna come here for a week on holiday and then go back and quarantine for 14 days. In China, it's the same thing. So that's gonna need a lot of effort between uh, the government in the Maldives, the foreign ministry, and the counterparts in our main market. The main markets being China, India, uh, Russia, Germany, uh, the UK, and Italy. If we can sort out those six markets and, um, and get that going, I think that would be fantastic. I, I see India opening up sooner because there's a very good relationship between uh, this new government, thank God, and, and India. They've developed a very good relationship with them. So I see India reopening very quickly. Um, the question is China, you know, which is the largest market to the country. And at this time of year, it accounts for a third of arrivals in the summer months. Um, so that's going to take a lot of effort. It's, 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 it's not going to be easy. Um, it's, 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 as you know, Jana, you know, you're a builder. Um, it, it's very easy to destroy. It's very easy to stop and burn down and destroy, but it's very difficult to build. And um, it's not going to be easy, uh, but I have every faith in the government. I think they've done an amazing job so far. Um, it's going to require a lot of effort from all of us. So I think we We've, we've, um, we've gone, to, gone, gone to the first step of opening up our boundaries, our, our borders, um, creating guidelines by which those borders will be open. But there are many steps to go. It's still a wrong, long road ahead. And when I say long road ahead, it's, it's over the next um, 40 days until we get into early July. But I have no doubt that if we are proactive over the next 30 days, uh, tourism will rebound. Um, in terms of the ADB estimates, um, I suspect that the 1.8% is a little optimistic. Um, I, I do see a lot of demand picking up, but we've lost a lot of ground. Um, so my, my gut feel is that it'll be somewhere between the 90 and the 300 million. Um, but that really depends very much on us, you know, as the tourism industry in the Maldives and how much effort we do. It's all within our hands um, to, to restart tourism. Really, 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 um Good intervention, Ms. Sun. And uh, I think uh, from what you have said, uh, uh, we realize how important it is to be engaged, especially with the airlines, with the various governments, especially the key uh, countries that are uh, sending, you know, um, inbound tourism to the Maldives. So um, I was I was uh, reading about the case of New Zealand and Australia as a bubble, right? So I think uh, that's a strategy we could follow. Um, and if we have this dialogue with India, China, Britain and uh, other key markets, as you said, it's six countries. So I think uh, the government, uh, they are doing, as you rightly said, they are doing, taking very good steps right now. So I think the engagement with the airlines, the engagement with the you know relevant governments and the agencies, I think that would be key 
for us to succeed in in this situation. Um, I think it's it's very well very well said. Um, my next question. So we also have a question and answer session after this. So we will have an interactive session after, afterwards. But we will have some more questions. So we'll coming back to you. Um, I will now um, put forward my next question to my young friend and uh, you know uh, one of the best marketing guys in the country with a record of nine years at Agoda uh, and experience in Booking.com, Mr. Um, Murad, um, the head of uh, Villa Hotels Business Development. Murad, my question is, uh, what do you think is the best strategy to market Maldives under the current circumstances and what are our target markets? I think Sonu mentioned six countries. Um, let us see what, what, what you have to say about how can we kickstart Maldives, you know, how can we put Maldives, you know, back on track? So, thank you. Am I being heard? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. <laughs> okay, cool. So, yes, this is one of the, the most important questions to ask. What will be the strategy? There are many ways, and strategy is a big word, especially on the backdrop of a, a crisis like we are in. But I think to start with, if you look at, if, if you ask any human being, they, they will always keep questioning what will be the health risk under any circumstance at, on anything. And um, I think, so there are two points that I need to highlight. One, uh, uh, Sonu also briefly touched about air traffic, but the first one will be building the confidence on uh, the healthcare systems that we have in here, on, on the mainland, on the resorts, and to make sure that the critical and non-critical healthcare uh, facilities are available to all the people who are visiting us. So building this and making sure that there's reliable testing mechanism in case it is needed. And I also note right now that yes, it is not uh, easy and viable to really keep testing people as they come in. So that is not an option, but do we have built capacity and systems when we can utilize when we can need when when we can you when we need it. Sorry about that. Um, the so do we give a unified message about the healthcare uh, readiness that we have? Because this is a question that we are asking. If you look, really look at some of the OTA, some of the offline agents or, or wholesalers, they're already building their own mechanisms to ensure that hotels have. Uh, uh, enough or essential healthcare systems set up. So they have their own checklist. They even employ the, the expert or external auditors just to check what's going on on the resorts before they start sending the people. So how do we give this message out as a destination uh, collectively, including the resorts, the travel agents, the National Tourist Board as well? So that is the point number one um, in terms of making sure that we have a good setup to recover tourism in the near future. Uh, the other one is traffic. Uh, like Sono mentioned, we have to incentivize it. And, and of course, targeting the key origins that we have, key markets that we have, we need to make sure that, that we incentivize the, the air traffic that is coming to the markets. For example, we know that, that the private jets are coming in already. And, and we know that at, at a small scale, it is working and it has its own confidence level out there. And we know that, yes, this can be scaled, but not only from Mali, right? It has, we have to open multiple gates uh, to the country. Uh, so there are many multiple gates now, uh, which many gates now to the country. And I think there's, there's no option um, to, to keep it closed now because if you really try to bring all the people through Mali, the, the clogging will really put, pull us down. The idea will be to incentivize traffic into other uh, entry points and open it up. So that those are the, 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 the medium or immediate um, strategies that we need to take to bring in people into the country. Great, Murad. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, yeah. 
from what you have said, uh, we all understand that um, um, we have to be. We, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, continue. Sorry, yeah, please. I just yeah. build on what Murad's saying. I, 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 firstly, thank you, for Murad, for all your comments and all, all that you, you, you said earlier made, makes a lot of sense. And um, I, I just want to just reinforce what he's saying. So um, I, I think he's, com he's completely correct that um, we need to get a, a happy balance between state and tourism. Um, it's a bit like, uh, you know, the, 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 that, that symbol of, um, of justice, you know, that you see in the US with uh, the balance. And, um, you know, we've got to give this perception and make people feel comfortable for this is safe, whilst at the same time not making it too much hard work. And, and I think the latest state tourism guidelines that the government have put together are brilliant. I mean, they've been very responsive. Uh, the latest draft, I think, is really addressing that very well. Um, and I, I think testing is very important. We need to increase our testing capacity. So, you know, Murad was saying testing, testing is, is, is essential. Um, I, I actually like the first draft where there was a test on arrival. I understand from the ministry that uh, the government feel that they won't have the capacity in time to test everyone on arrival. And I completely sympathize that with that because we actually uh, made a donation. So we've made a donation of one test team and 10 kits, uh, 5,000 kits and one test team. So about $150,000 investment. Um, we've been working with ADK and we placed an order for the Roth life cycle machine, which is meant to be one of the best real-time PCR machines. Um, We've been told for the last two weeks that we will be given a date when that machine will be delivered. Every day, we've been told every day, every day. And as you can imagine, there's just so much global demand for test machines. That's the challenge is getting them. So I, I, I think the aspiration is great. Um, I think we need to get test machines. It is our goal that every guest on arrival will be tested, um, even if the government don't uh, mandate that because we want to create COVID-free islands. I think the, uh, talking about the branding and how the Maldives can brand itself as being unique and safe in these times, um, I think this idea of one island, one resort. Uh, the Maldives is unique in that it's naturally isolated uh, by, you know, 1100 or whatever, you know, 1150, whatever islands it is. Um, and I think that, that gives the Maldives, well, could it be 1300? I might have got the number wrong. But, you know, uh, the Maldives have so many islands, so there's a natural isolation. So I think if we play one island wide port and market that, and we buy and implement it, that would give a lot of confidence. And I think this point about opening up the country with smaller planes coming in to smaller airports makes a lot of sense because some of these airlines will not want to start to fly in so, uh, with big planes. So Emirates, of course, their smallest plane is a, a 777, but you have um, Qatar who have, um, as we know, the A320. Um, we have Etihad, who has 737s, which are single aisle, you know, the um, single aisle planes rather than the wide body planes. So that could be a nice way to, for them to start because what tourists want is frequency of flights and frequency of connections. So rather than sort of, uh, you know, in the, in the past, Qatar had three A350s flying a day, Emirates, I think, four 777s. So rather than starting with that, why not starting with two uh, 737s? You know, one, say, going to Mafaru and the Noon Atoll, one going to Mali, um, smaller aircraft, smaller loads, less risk, um, you know, more frequency. So I, I, think, that, um, I think that's very important. So um, thank you, Murad. I, 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 I agree in, I'd like to hear what Murad was saying. Yeah, I think, I think um, you both are on, on the same line of thinking, which means that, you know, we all agree uh, on, on certain, you know, common, common rules here that, uh, that uh, we, that the fear of uh, flying, you know, um, we have to help that, you know, mitigate the, the, that situation. And that would, that is what would lead to have people coming here, right? So with good policies, with what is going on with the government and the private sector, I think Maldives will be able to give that confidence to the travelers that we are doing the right thing and people like Sonu and other, you know, resort owners are investing uh, to give that, you know, security on the health front. Uh, which is a very good thing. So uh, what I was thinking the other day was like, uh, when we have a uniform health guideline, that is the basic minimum that uh, uh, we follow, right? But that should be a uniform guideline. But beyond that, we all have the 
we all have the freedom to make it more attractive like you know we can keep investing you know further to make sure that our clients are more comfortable so individual resorts can go to any extent right so it doesn't stop us doing those things so i think it's uh, very interesting what's what i mean the discussion is so far very interesting khadir you had something to say you know before i go to the, my next question you wanted to say something please and yeah, after that uh, gias you wanted to say something right uh, yes yeah. khadir i wanted to highlight that basically i i'm not fully agreeing to that we have to do a pcr test for every single tourist that is coming to mountain you see we can afford those kind of test can possibly be able to perform at a very boutique resorts like soniva and then very top end luxury resort but the vast majority of uh, most this market is mid range and if we really wanted to build up the volume and have a fast recovery performing a, a, a pcr test on every tourist arrival is practically impossible as i said before there is a scarcity of these machines and even the test kit available no country in the world is going to put the holiday makers to perform the uh, the uh, the pcr test just to let these people go on a holiday and then again we do a second set in test here in male that's practically impossible to do we need to find a right balance when it comes to do performing the pcr test we have to be a little bit pro, uh, the practical in our approach on the road to recovery just uh, having a nice sop written nice to hear and nice to see on the eyes doesn't really help on the real uh, uh, reality to recover from the global crisis we will have to face the reality so i think i think yeah i think in this situation um um the the minimum that we have to follow is the who guidelines the wto yeah. guidelines and the local guidelines i think when we try to you know um when we try to uh, if we try to follow those Uh, that's the that's the basic minimum that we should do because that give that would give the international community the travelers that you know Maldives is ready with uh, you know uh, conformity to um, the basic guidelines from the international organizations as well as local uh, organizations. So I think that's where we should work. Um, yeah. I mean, if you if you have to say anything else, Sono, you want to you want to intervene, say what Khalil is thinking. You know, you you want to. you want to have all the machines you want to have that security for your travelers on the other side khalil has a different view so what do you do you say son so no i think, I think um, we missed him sono has uh, some issues with the internet again yeah we try to get him back gias you want to say something about this uh Uh, see, uh, let's look at the numbers. I think um, when we talk about scenarios in, in the Maldives, I think uh, now we are on, um, according to our finance ministry, on scenario number uh, three, uh, starting in July, right? And in scenario number three, it says that uh, we are expecting for the rest of the year four hundred and sixty-two thousand eight hundred and forty-six uh, tourists to come, because already we have uh, over. Three hundred and eighty-two thousand six hundred and seventy-eight. So for the rest of the year, almost uh, over four hundred thousand tourists. So it, let's say, okay, July we we don't we're not going to get any tourists in July, or we we get some tourists in July. But let's say come August we are going to see some numbers and some decent numbers. And given the government's uh, forecast of four hundred thousand. Tourist will come in scenario three for the rest of the year. Let's say in these five months, we bring that four hundred thousand to two hundred thousand, and with that also, if you divide it, it's about forty-six thousand uh, tourists a month. Which means we need to do forty-six thousand tests, and which means per day we have to do over thousand five hundred tests. So I think, uh, I, like I said, it is, these are all very good ideas, but I don't think Maldives as yet has the infrastructure. I mean, we are still struggling even to test our own people. I wish we were like uh, Iceland, where we could have tested half the country by now. But uh, like Sonu was saying as well, getting the test kits and things, there's a lot of uh, challenges. And again, I'm not trying to uh, criticize somebody saying that we're not doing a good job. Obviously, we are doing the best with our resources, but 
I, I, I am worried that uh, we, would we have enough tests for locals if this happens? Would we have enough tests for tourists then? Uh, because right now, I think our capacity with IGMH and ADK is just close to 1,000, 1,200 per day. Uh, so that, that is a worry. I mean, I'm again trying to be realistic here. Uh, and um, I, I see, I hope that we can find a way that we can work something out. Yeah. Right. So, so no, I will I will ask you because now I think the discussion is on the testing and the health uh, front. I think we have uh, uh, differing views. Um, Khalil uh, has this, uh, you know, strong belief that we we you know we cannot do the PCR testing for everyone, right? And here, right. Um, you know, so um, your intervention and you know how far should we you know go on. Uh, testing yeah. the, the incoming tourists, inbound tourists, how can we right. manage this situation? What are we going yeah. to do in the resort itself? You know, uh, right. this, is, this is a health crisis. How are we going to manage yeah. this situation? You know, so yeah. can you show us a picture of the real situation where we are going to encounter, like when we, okay, we open the resorts tomorrow, we open the borders. Okay, with yeah. limited, uh, limited uh, you know, flights, with limited, even with limited flights still, we cannot avoid the question of uh, the, the health aspect, right? Because uh, there will be there will be you know people coming from very infected areas as well, right? So if we if if those borders open, some countries are opening up. We saw the list of yeah. countries opening up the other day, right? Sixty countries. So if we are allowing our borders to open, definitely infected people would come. And how are we going to? How are we going to face this real time situation? You know, when we open the borders, what are the risks involved? You know, I think uh, uh, I'd yeah. like to hear from you. Yes, no, thank you. Um, yeah, it, you, you, you've raised great points. Um, I hear completely uh, what Gia said, um, and, and Murad, I, I completely understand um, uh, those um, th those points. Um, you know, thank you for 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 your comments there. Uh, about testing and being practical. So um, it, it is, I mean, it is true in quite a few countries, it's difficult to get a test if you don't show symptoms. So the current guidelines um, insist on a test being taken seven days before arrival. Um, and there are quite a few countries that don't do that because if you, if you don't have symptoms because of the scarcity of tests, or if you haven't been in contact with someone who's positive, um, they won't test you. But that said, um, We've been asking around because we want to help potential clients. So we've been in touch with all the markets and we've started to identify companies in most countries, at least the six principal markets. So at the moment, we're just focusing on the six principal markets. In those principal markets, we're starting to find country, companies that will offer testing for our clients. So it is a possibility. Um, and we've still got another 30 days to go. And the testing, you know, these testing machines are being produced. If you think about it, you know, we started with covid um, in full swing at the end of J J January. That's when China locked down. As you remember, America was dodging all of March. In all of March, Trump was saying it's not going to affect us. You know, no one's infected in the US. Everyone was infected. Well, there were a lot of people infected. They just hadn't tested them, so they didn't know. Um, and, and so it's only been sort of 60 days, really, that these companies have started to gear towards testing. And for us, it's been very important. So I've had discussions with um, experts um, in virology and infectious diseases from the UK, three or four people, the United States, Singapore, et cetera, and companies that provide testing. And what I've seen is the capacity has grown enormously of testing machines. So I think uh, we will see a growth. Um, in terms of answer the question of the capacity of testing, so at the moment, ADK have a baby machine from Roche the Lifestyle 96, uh, that does 700 tests a day. So 700 tests a day, just the ADK new machine. Uh, we've ordered the same from ADK. That it was meant to be delivered by June. That will go into Mafaru Airport, and that will be another 700 tests if it's going to be delivered mid-June. We still haven't quite got um, a delivery date, but they had told us on ordering that it would be uh, four weeks, and, that, and we ordered two weeks ago. So we need to see if that will be delivered. Um, I know that uh, the, the guy government were talking to ADK, who are the distributors of Roche, who are testing companies, uh, to buy the Cobas. The Cobas actually makes about 3,000 tests a day. So it's all automated. The machine 
and it, it just it's like a robot you know the robot takes the test kit and it does 3000 at a time and that gives you a test result within six hours um there's also these gene expert machines um which again you can scale up uh, from a company called cfide um there you don't need a laboratory um there's a little cartridge the test it's clipped itself is a cartridge and you just buy the machine you install it and it can do again huge numbers but um with them it, there's an availability issue with cfide but with roche um there is a possibility but perhaps not immediately so um I personally believe that testing is important because when you look at this virus, uh, what's interesting is that it, it's not that virulent. Why it stopped the world is because it's contagious, because more virulent viruses normally show signs immediately. So you catch a flu and within day one, you're, you're sneezing, you're coughing, uh, you've got a fever, everyone keeps away from you. With COVID, because it's so mild, um, that doesn't happen. So I think we've got to learn with living with COVID. So um, someone mentioned earlier, and I can't remember who, and I apologize uh, for not remembering that, um, this point of fear. And FDR, uh, when he took power and, um, you know, during the Great Depression, uh, when he started, to, you know, became, you know, uh, president of the United States, in his inauguration speech, he said that the greatest fear is fear itself. And um, when we look at the, put things into context and perspective with this. So firstly, if you're under 50, experts in infectious disease, and I ask all of them the same question. If you're under 50, what is the fatality rate compared with some of the serious influenzas? Like there was the one UH1N in 2018. Uh, they said that the fatality rate is the same or less if you're under 50. So it's only the old or the infirm where there's a challenge with a fatality rate. Then I asked, um, I, we did some research on the spread. So the United States Center for Biodefense in Maryland, um, in one of the White House briefings last week, um, they announced their research and, and they took the COVID virus and they found that in wintry temperatures where the humidity is low, 25% percent, and where the temperature is below 75 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you know, which is like Miami, um, you know, in, in the winter months, um, the half rate, half life of the virus, if it spills onto a surface, is 18 hours. Once you get to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what we're ex experiencing now today in Mali, and 80% humidity, the half life is one hour. And if you're exposed to some UV, so if you're in the open air, it's two minutes, the half life of the virus. In Hong Kong, they contact traced people and those who came into COVID patients outside in the open air, yeah, uh, came, sorry, came, came into, um, into contact with infected COVID people, out of 7,000 people, only one caught the infection outside. So um, there's a lot of fear at the moment. And um, if we're in our climate, and if, there's, um, if it's in the open air, like in our resort, um, if we're maintaining good hygiene standards, um, and there is some UV, um, the half-life of the virus on a surface is two minutes, as little as two minutes. Um, the spread rate is very, very low in the open air. Um, and funny enough, in planes, the air is exchanged 14 times. It's the same as an ICU unit. People are saying it's, it's dangerous to fly. But when they contact trace, they only contact trace the row, row in front and the row behind. If this plane was this big infectious uh, environment, why would they contact trace more, not contact trace more people? So um, I think in summary, um, the way to go forward in the new normal is to test, is to put a marker on people to say, I have COVID because there's no sign overtly. Um, it's to build your immune system. So if you do get it, you're one of those people who uh, don't show any symptoms at all and you're, you're fine. Um, and the second thing is for us to just develop this conventional wisdom, this collective wisdom that is perhaps not so bad. You know, if you're not old, if you're not infirm, it's not a problem. And I focus, our focus should be restarting the economy, getting things back to normal, and then thinking about how we protect the old and the infirm. Because I think the last thing we would want as a, as a child is to kill our parents. So, you know, you're infected, you're fine, you're not going to die. Um, you might not even show any symptoms. But you go home and you infect your parents who are very old, um, you know, got a couple of years to live only. Uh, they may have some diseases that you, not, you naturally get because of old age. Um, and this is the final blow. Um, I think that's the last thing anyone will yeah. want to have on their 
So I think I think um, I think we all agree that so, um, testing, so is, testing is testing is very important, and I think the government is on the right track with the, uh, you know increasing the capacity to test. And uh, I think um, as long as we are aware uh, of uh, you know what we are doing, and we are on that track. Uh, because we have to protect our tourists, we also have to protect our local um, local um, population. We also have to protect our staff. So I think um, when we have a balance on that, I think we can uh, move on um, uh, in the right direction. Um, we have some important important questions. We are running out of time. I'll try to put forward one more question to each panelist and then open up for Q and A. Um, my next question would be to Murad. Uh, Murad, uh, I would like to ask you, um, what competitive advantage would Maldives have when everyone else is also planning to open their borders for tourism at once? You know, likely in July, August, you know, so we're going to open our borders at once, for the entire world, you know. It's like the world is opening up at once. It's, it's not like a competition, you know, in different stages. It's going to be competition. I don't think the world has seen anything like this before. Everybody wants the the you know the the tourists back to their own country. So what can we do differently as Maldives? That's my next question. So, excellent. So they there are a few things that we need to shout out loud, which is by default given to us by the nature of the tourism industry that we have. So for example, we we don't get to rub shoulders with many and cross paths with many on the resort islands because the way that we are set up, we don't have we don't we are not like a city hotel so so luckily you know the the part of the usps for all the resorts in the maldives is seclusion and disconnect i believe so no you remember that no news no shoes type uh, but this time also with a lot less people as well but we we somehow lost track of that as a message out into the market from the maldives some hotels privately they kept pushing it but that is not how Maldives is known anymore. Yeah, of course, it's for the beach. But I think if you really make a recall function work for that specific feature that we have, we will be able to get people to start believing in, yes, yes, I'm on a resort, but I'm safe because I am, I am secluded. I am experiencing very private uh, stay, and I'm not going to go through... Uh, you know, city malls and, and I don't know, crowded roads. Uh, this, is, this is by default what we have. But I think over time, what we have done is we have taken our eyes away from the very important key message that we give, that private islands where one island, one resort by default will not let you get out. And that message has to be reinstated. And I think we, 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 we mentioned the Ministry of Tourism or Tourism Promotion Board uh, going out with, with, with a message that actually brings us together. Now, that is kind of the message that we also want to give in the first question that you asked me. You know, we, we, we just discussed about a lot of testing that has to do with us being very secure about tourists coming. What is the message that we give to tourists about their confidence, right? Yes. So presence of good uh, healthcare system, testing mechanisms, but the message itself is going to really boost uh, the, the confidence that we want people. These are, these are the people that will decide to come to the Maldives or not, right? And that is when we really get the message out. But if you really look at collective messaging that we have, we've never done this before. We have never had a a comprehensive a marketing communication system, you know, going, you know, hand in hand with tourism board. Everyone goes their own way. They spend multi-million dollar every year. They possibly achieve their goals, but as a destination is Maldives. I think we have gone divergent and we possibly lost some of the, some of the cool that we used to have. Um, we need to get it back. And to do that, we will need to get out into the market prioritize where we want or what we want Maldives to be. And that I believe should include these USPs or, or seclusion and disconnect. And that is the very thing people will be looking forward for. And, and if you yep. really look at, for example, it, there are no many small islands uh, uh, of Maldives type uh, that actually does tourism like we do. So uh, 
we are standing, we are standing on a set of uh, competitive advantage. We just need to shout it out. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, uh, all the polls that are going on around the world, you know, in the US, in, in Europe, I think the first destination, all of them, they want to visit is Maldives after the lockdowns are open, right? So, uh, over. so I think, I think Maldives is uh, placed in, you know, um, very well because uh, as we understand, there are a lot of book, booking inquiries happening and as Sonu said, you know, his own resorts are, you know, experiencing, I think, Khalil, have, we all have the same uh, feeling, right? That, that, that it's going to be the best destination, it's going to be the uh, place that everyone wants to come after the lockdown. I think that is the marketing strategy. That would be the strategy for us to, you know, promote ourselves. Um, yeah. My next uh, question. I would, I, 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 I would add to that, by the way, is, is that multiple gate of entry, because that's the only place of congestion that we, we will ever have or for a near future. And yes, yes. Uh, Mafaro and a few other airports, if we really start making it mainstream yes. for entry, that yes. that will declog the the system yes. that we have but also Khalil, Khalil and I, we have, we have Kudu, Khalil has Dalo at all you know we have we have several we have Gan, we have Mamingili right so i think yes i mean compared to an island nation we have uh, you know many options that can beat our other competitors right um Khalil, my next question would be uh, to you um, with the reopening of borders, uh, the airlines will play a very vital role in picking up the tourist numbers, you know. How, you, how do you think the travel pick up uh, from what region do we expect and the uh, least and highest traffic in the upcoming months, you know, what, what's, what's your, you know, um, forecast? Which, which airlines would operate, uh, who, would, who would be keen to, you know, uh, connect uh, the Maldives and how, how would that happen? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Jana. <clears throat> Our market research actually shows that people will prefer to domestic and regional travel at this moment. Sentiment at most, most at the moment are most positive from India, Middle East, and China. But India maybe they will open their border maybe end of July. Middle East, there is no sign to get open free of September. And China, there is a little hope but it's really questionable due to politics. Europe definitely is not going to open before November. My gut feeling is they will open only for uh, from December onwards. But uh, in order to restart actually the tourism in our economy, we will have to start immediately to build a certain dialogue between the governments from the source markets and together with the two operators. High level uh, bilateral talks are really required to initiate the air traffic. Just opening up the border and announcing a date of our border opening is not going to be enough. Government must consider to lower the fees provided other incentive for the international carriers to encourage and to make this destination more affordable. You see, if you read, if you watch all the news, I would say that most commercial airlines across the globe are already bleeding heavily. They would not basically wanted to fly to Maldives from the start unless there is a significant demand for them. And neither they can basically afford to keep half of the seats empty and then fly to these routes. So in, it's very important actually for us to have a proper dialogue uh, we, between the two operators and state level and to initiate these routes and to provide specially kind of an incentive that are required to do. As of now, most of nation are focused on regional travel. Like you said, New Zealand, New, New Zealand and Australia travel bubble. There could be similar bubbles in other parts of the world too. China actually has clearly indicated that their focus at the moment when it comes to tourism is purely on domestic. There is unlikely to see any um, significant number producing from this market for this summer. Another factor could be, again, the relationship that we have with the government to government level. That actually might play an important role. At the end of the day, 
China actually is one of the sing biggest and oh single source biggest source market for commodities for the last few years, especially most or the bulk of the industry inventory really depends on the market. Almost every single hotel depends on Chinese market during summer period, the, our low season. So this summer, uh, this summer is definitely not going to happen. So we will have to look at how we can really start. We, we, we have to start a dialogue between the governments in order to initiate this uh, recovery process fast. And the government must consider basically to give incentive for the other uh, the international carrier to come instead of going it to our competing destination like Caesars, Mauritius, and other places. And the other thing that we will also have to look at, like Murad has mentioned, that opening up a different uh, you know, airports, regional airports, like you also mentioned, that Dalu Airport is basically we are we have 1,800 meter runway, which basically can allow to land global. Uh, the, the jets basically, even in Dal at all, there are uh, resorts of a very high end like Central East, Miyama, and those people on average they basically get 40 50 jets uh, on, on an annual basis. So instead of making them to land in Male and then having Male airport congested, they can go directly to these places. And in 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 what we are told, you have your airport basically, there are high end resorts there. So you instead of making them to go and fly to Mali, they could basically go directly there. And then Ardu, there is a very good airport, so we could basically use that as another hub instead of uh, Mali. So we will have to basically dilute the traffic that is coming into Mali through the other regional airports. That's basically the way to do this one. So that's basically my take on this. Government has to play a key role in order to speed up the process of recovery. Government has to develop a better dialogue between the private sectors, airlines, and multi-party talks has to be done in a productive way in order to incentivize people to come to Maldives. Just opening up the border is not going to be enough. Our language has to be used properly. And our geographical advantage of being located on the middle of the equator actually have proven that uh, uh, it actually helps to curb the spread of the virus. Our maybe salty air together with the heat actually is helping even to kill the virus. So that basically is getting proof the kind of data that we are getting through the HPA. And those things I would suggest basically us to utilize and use in our favor in our marketing communication. We have to do have a better and more smarter marketing marketing communication uh, strategies in place in order to provide the confidence and comfort for the future potential tourists to come to Maldives. So the confidence and comfort is the key for our success and key message has to be there. The assurance from uh, the market and destination is uh, very vital to have a fast recovery. I'm sure that um, Mr. Ono also will agree that each resort basically has a, a quite a good health facilities available in, and they also have a health and safety uh, uh, auditor based in the resorts. I would say that most of the hotels already they have. So food and health and safety is uh, one of a crit critical component even before COVID. So that basically we can enhance it and people may not be aware of this, but it is there in the resort. All right, um, yes, uh, safe zones, um, multiple airports, multiple gateways, and once Mali area is clear of the infection, Mali airport can start. So I think we, we, are, we are very clear on, you know, uh, where we are heading, right? Where we, where we could, you know, um, manage the situation, how we could manage the situation under the circumstances. Kias, my next yeah. question to you, um, just, uh, uh, it's a combination of two questions. Uh, international tourism down by 22% in quarter one uh, and could decline by 60 to 80% uh, you know, when you distribute across the year. What are the possible scenarios that can be expected? And um, prospects of recovery keep uh, downgraded several times since the outbreak and uncertainty still continues to dominate. Um, second wave, third wave, what could we expect in this scenario? 
is there you know uh, hope for us that uh, we could manage this situation as a country uh, what would be your thoughts on it? um i firstly i would say i mean going back to what i said earlier about uh, the scenarios um uh, you know government says there's five scenarios and if you look at um, i was just looking at the mira co collection figures and revenue figures uh, i think uh, the last one available was at the april figures and if you look at april uh, we had about a receipt of uh, i think 23 million us dollars compared to last year's 55 million and that is about 58% uh, decline compared to last year and i'm sure uh, may june this figure is also going to be lower but what my point is um, this is in line with uh, what um, what UNWTO is saying between 60 and 80 percent decline that they are, they are uh, seeing, and uh, I think at this moment it is very difficult to do uh, a scientific prediction or give some accurate figure on what this could be because there's, there are so many different things, so many different moving parts uh, that's at play here. Uh, obviously, the degree of health and economic impact of each uh, source market. Uh, the frequency and price of flights that we've been talking about and also how these competing destinations other competing destinations with more and more resources how are they going to react and what are they doing um, all these moving parts makes a, a huge huge difference in uh, the way we we, we, we see this and uh, i think uh, um, uh, Countries are obviously, and countries really, really need to focus on these bilateral discussions that, again, we've been talking about, about restarting routes. Um, until there is a vaccine out there, I don't see recovery being anything close to what it was. Um, everyone is saying 2021 is going to be the real year. We're going to see some decent numbers. Uh, I'm not saying that 2020 would not uh, have any numbers, but I think I would uh, I would be uh, very cautious about that, and I think I would go with what UNWTO is saying right now. And uh, the second question about uh, uh, the different waves, uh, you know, <laughs> whether there is light at and then the tunnel, uh, whether it's the first wave, second wave, third, and how uh, are we going to prevent or mitigate uh, this? I think, firstly, I'm not an epidemiologist to to be again. Uh, or health expert to, to go into detail in this. But all I know is tourism will bounce back. Uh, we have weathered through uh, many, many different uh, incidences in the past. Uh, but however, I understand the severity of this is much, much worse than we've seen. Uh, there is obviously that uh, fear of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, several waves, whether it is one, two, three uh, coming, but I think in general, the whole world has reacted to this in a very fast manner. Uh, across the world, we are seeing work done on vaccine at a pace that we have never, never seen in the past. Uh, but the fact is, waves are inevitable. Success of a country will depend on the mechanisms that has been put in place prior to opening and how immediately can we contain those uh, and what measures and what, how we are going to, if, if at all, have any introduction uh, with obviously minimum a minimal uh, disruption. Um, on, on a positive note, I also want to, because I know we are all talking a lot of negative things in terms of, uh, of, of this virus, but uh, I, I also want to uh, bring uh, a lot of optimism into this because I see a lot of countries and a lot of businesses are actually adopting very well to this. Um, you know, especially in the Maldives, uh, we see several resorts and uh, even guest houses are implementing internationally recognized safety and health programs. Uh, uh, people are trying their best to instill that confidence so that when the tourists come, they feel happy and they feel uh, more, more than anything secure and that peace of mind being in the Maldives. Um, and uh, whether there is light at the end of the tunnel, to that I would, I would refer to two of the things that I was just reading yesterday and day before. One is a Google search trend that was reviewed uh, during the lockdown uh, during, in US that Maldives had top uh, list of all the search destinations, uh, then followed by Greece and Fiji. But Maldives became the number one uh, for U.S. travelers that they have been searching during this lockdown. And even uh, there was a few weeks ago, one of the largest OTAs, uh, Booking.com, revealed that a Maldivian resort was among their top three, uh, one of the wish-listed resorts by their travelers. I mean, with all fairness, I think Murad is one of your resorts, uh, Paradise Island, I think. 
Uh, and just a few days ago, um, Expedia Singapore came out and said that, um, that uh, their forecast and majority of the Singaporeans uh, if, have chosen Maldives from their research or survey that would travel between uh, you know, the rest of the year and Maldives is the number one most preferred holiday destination. So the appetite is there. So definitely, definitely there is light at the end of the tunnel. And in fact, I am, I would even say that there is a huge flashing light that is head with headlights, uh, you know, that is blinking on Maldives. So yeah, that's good news. Yeah, just uh, uh, two more questions, uh, to one from Murad and one from Sonu, and then I'll open up. The uh, prayer time is approaching, so um, we'll have to, you know, um, uh, be very short. Uh, Murad, uh, um, what I would, there's a question from someone. Um, um, are we, are we uh, doing enough uh, spending, uh, enough, do you think we are spending enough to market and advertise the Maldives? Under the current situation, do we need an additional budget for this? Yes. Are, are we spending enough? Enough is a very vague uh, word to use under a circumstance like this. It's never enough, anyways. Um, but right. but I, can say that I, I, I can say that we are not doing uh, nearly enough uh, to really mitigate uh, what's, uh, you know, what we need to do. Uh, mitigate the, the risks that we are facing and the problems that we are facing are due to COVID. Now, if you really look at other destinations, they, they swung into operation very early on, um, trying to stay on top of mind, trying to stay in the con consideration set of the guests. Yes, we may have a, a search result set, which is really very promising, the flashlight, I agree with the guests. Uh, and yes, so, but it, it could be a big, big floodlight. Um, that's that's what we need. Uh, we could shout out. The are we doing enough? I think we are not. Why? If you really look at what's happening, I just saw the the article on travel and leisure. Uh, it's talking about those those old first draft information about fifty thousand and a hundred dollar charge and hundred dollar test charge and visa fees. Also, we didn't do enough. We are absolutely nowhere near where we want to be. I think we have failed uh, miserably in that area. Unfortunately, it's uh, my friend uh, Toib's area of expertise, but I know also what happened to, to, to that news going out had nothing to do with him. But again, it went out. Question is now, in the, from the marketing perspective, did you do, what did we do to mitigate the, the, the fallout because of something going out like that? We didn't. We still haven't. We are still discussing. The news is flashing big. All the major outlets picked it, picked it up. Actually, we have done more damages because of that. Uh, I, I keep in touch with our partners uh, very often. All of them, call them. You know, the first reaction is that, hey, how are we going to sell? Because there's no filtered mechanism to send a message to those people. So what they see is from the, from, from the news outlet. So uh, from the strategic perspective, did we do enough? No. Uh, do you think we can do? I think we can do a lot more. Do they have capacity to do more? 100% agreed that they have a lot more capacity to do. If we really look at, you know, I don't know how much they spend, or, you know, so I can't really say it is enough, but I think they need a supplementary budget to, to get a share of voice in the international markets. It is absolutely necessary, but also we have a very small budget compared to many other competing countries. So can we actually team up with private sector? They spend a lot. They spend a lot, actually a lot more than collectively, a lot more than tourism board itself. So can we, can we really team up with private sector and really get some messages uh, in, in harmony with the national uh, interest? Uh, we can do that. The, the, the other thing to look at will be invest in a, a phased holistic plan to, to make sure that, like I said, to sync it up to the industry effort uh, to bring the back to the bring back the visitors. For example, toning down those kind of statements that went out that is currently disturbing us in a big way. Uh, I'm sorry I have to keep repeating it because it's, it's really disturbing. Um, uh, and we need to really be very, very careful. If you really look at how the tourism dollar by tourism uh, department is spent, 
there's no ROI, there's no tracking. They don't know what actually came out of what they spent because that's still, we are using very old methodologies uh, uh, to, to market. Uh, it needs to change. There has to, be, there has to be a number attached to what we are spending and what we get out of it. Uh, we don't do that now. Uh, so under the current situation, do we need additional budget? Yes, if you really need a good share of voice in the markets, in the top markets that, that produce to us, uh, we need, a, we need a, a bigger budget, definitely. Thank you very much. I think uh, the collective effort, the yeah. collective effort between uh, uh, the private sector and the government, I think uh, if, we, if we do that, we will do far better than uh, what we are doing right now. And I think the spirit is there. I think the government and the private sector, uh, there's no uh, more opportune time than this period for us to join hands together. And I think we all are there to support the government in any initiative. And I think that's the approach we should take. So no, I will just uh, pass the, um, the last question to you. Uh, we are approaching the prayer time. If we uh, cross the prayer time, we will have to pause for five minutes if we have more questions. But can you, uh, I would appreciate if you can just uh, uh, keep your response within five minutes to my last question. And okay. then we'll give 15 minutes of quick Q&A. And if we have more questions, we will pause for five minutes for prayer time. And then, you know, we will just uh, try to entertain those questions. If not, we will finish at 6.15. Otherwise, you know, um, uh, we will just continue after a small break. Um, so the last question, so uh, for the panelists from my side, um, I'll, I'll combine two questions, but it's, it's related to the um, jobs. Uh, so, so what are the necessary um, actions that are necessary uh, for the socioeconomic impact on this pandemic and to accelerate recovery? And tourism has been hard hit with, uh, you know, in Maldives, thousands of jobs lost, millions of jobs worldwide, um, mostly, you know, uh, in Maldives, in the tourism sector. Yeah. What partnerships could save the day for us, for our workers, you know, for the local population, for everyone that has been working in that industry? Yeah. What could we do together? Yeah, no, sure. So um, I, I think we've already touched on it. I, I don't want to repeat what others yes. have said already. So, you know, how are we going to get people working again is to get tourism. Yes. Right. That, that's for sure. I mean, that's all we need to do is restart the economy, have tourists so we have uh, guests to look after and we can employ people uh, to look after those guests. Um, I, I think, you know, just to build on what Murad said um, earlier and um, Diaz, um, this idea of uh, uniting um, as, as the private sector with the government, um, I think this message of um, one island, one resort is very important. Um, you know, the sunny side of life needs to take um, uh, a, a sec, um, how do you say, take the back seat at the moment. It's not a great message um, at the moment. And we need to, uh, for at least for the next three months, just promote one island, one resort. And it's something that all the private sector, and, and you're right, Murad, um, you know, we spent, I think last year, uh, we spent $3 million between our resorts on marketing, uh, sales and marketing. I think that's most probably more than MMPRC's entire budget. So um, I think if we're all shouting on the same hymn sheet, one island, one resort, one island, one resort, um, I think that's a huge competitive advantage. I'm not going to repeat why it is, but because all the other panelists already explained that, you know, uh, and, and, and and we're seeing it already. So we're seeing it from clients. Uh, we're getting lots of interesting inquiries. People who are quite scared, want to come with their private jet. They want to privatize the island. We've never had more private island inquiries um, um, the, the, the before. Um, so I think that's, uh, that, that's going to be quite important. I think Khalil touched upon a, another important issue. Um, Khalil, my, my view on uh, Europe closed until November is that um, I don't think that would be the case because uh, a lot of Europe, Europe is democracies. Um, uh, they, they have to listen to the voters and the voters are fed up of staying at home. Uh, some want to travel within Europe, but some are also scared about traveling within Europe because it's an area that's had a lot of infections. Some countries haven't overcome it. And um, a lot of European destinations don't offer what the Maldives offers in terms of one island, one resort. So I saw an article where the government had made an announcement that as early as 1st July, bubbles. a travel bubble is where people only travel between two countries, like only between the EU. Um, or between Australia and New Zealand and nowhere else. No one else can come into that bubble. But a travel bridge is where um, you have these bilateral agreements, as Khalil mentioned. So 
the UK about talking about that, about having establishing travel bridges by the 1st of July. Uh, we know very well that this government and President Nasheed, uh, you know, spent a lot of his time in Europe, um, in, in, in the UK. I think Minister um, uh, of Tourism, Ali Wahid, was in the UK as well. There's a very good relationship between the Maldives and the UK and uh, the Maldives as part of the, the, British, the British Commonwealth. So um, I think we need to talk about travel bridges now. This point about the government working on bilateral agreements that Khalil mentioned is very important. Um, uh, I think India will be very easy, you're right Khalil, because of the relationship. The UK is a strong possibility. And the moment you have the UK, then you've got the rest of Europe. Because if the UK um, has this travel bubble with the rest of Europe, and then it's allowing these travel bridges between other countries, the fence is broken. So then the other European nations are going to say, well, if the Brits can go to, um, you know, to, to, um, to, to the Maldives, why can't the Germans? So I think engaging with them, travel bridges. Um, I think China will be the biggest um, challenge. But I was speaking last week with the Chinese ambassador to the Maldives, and he explained that the country is already entering into travel bridges, uh, sorry, um, fast tracks, uh, fast track agreements with certain countries where you, you, can, you can return from that country as a Chinese citizen, you get a test on returning, and you only have to quarantine for two days. So rather than saying quarantine for 14 days, and we have to remember that um, the Maldives is a big debtor of China. Uh, the Maldives owes China a lot of money, uh, bridges, etc., airports. So the Maldives, uh, China wants that cash back. The only way it's gonna get its cash back is the Maldives having cash and earning money. So um, I think with that and negotiating a fast track agreement between China and the Maldives and possibly linking each tourist arrival to some repayment of a loan might work. Because if you think about it, uh, China has 300,000 arrivals. If everyone spends three or 4,000 on a holiday, that's a billion dollars. The GST on that that the government gets is 125 million. So if the government could link some of that money from Chinese tourists, you know, X amount per tourist, to repaying debt, that could help. So I, I think we might find that these travel bridges uh, would work, but it, it, you're completely right. The government has to do a lot on that. So I think the government needs to help um, one island, one, tour, one resort as a, as a campaign, drop sunny side of life and travel bridges. Um, and then, um, yeah, and, and, I, and I think uh, Gas is right. I mean, he said that the Maldives appeared in the top search in Google. Um, India Condé Nast Traveller, it was the same thing. Um, people like this and we just need to spell it out more. And um, the demand is there. We need to create the ability. The ability is to create the airlines coming in and to uh, get countries, at least the principal six countries, uh, you know, UK, China, Russia, India, uh, Germany and Italy, get them to not make it onerous for their citizens to come to us and return. And, um, and I think then it's done and then we'll have tourists back um, and there'll be employment and everyone will be happy but um, okay, great yeah thank you so much I think we can finish this off in the next 15 minutes because uh, I have filtered down uh, the questions um, okay. because we had so many questions but I have filtered down because some of it we have uh, answered responded through our conversation um, so um, uh, I'll just read out the questions and then uh, any one of you can pick up if you feel like you know uh, you could answer that so the first question is uh, here, the one after filtering, I have taken about seven questions. So um, the first one is, do you think the Maldives are ready when we reopen in July? Do you think it's too soon? Would, would any of, uh, Murad, you would like to answer? I, I think we are ready. Um, it, it's not big, we are not getting people in thousands uh, to arrive a day. Um, Okay. Uh, I think we will, and, and, and it will be a good start because it will be slow, one. Um, yeah. And then we will know exactly what we are missing, uh, what we need to do. It'll be, uh, there, it has to start. It has to start now when it is low and we have to scale it up to a level where we see a sustainable demand is, is, hand, is oh, sustainable demand can be handled. So if you really look at it, uh, is there any demand coming in? I, I, I think there may be a few flights that may start, uh, but of course the feeder markets are not opening up the gate. So the, the, the relative arrivals that you would see starting from July, August uh, up to September will stay low. If We haven't seen any of the, the major airline announcing their next 10 or uh, 20 uh, destinations and Maldives is in that. Uh, 
uh, as a list, but we see tourists said, you know, keeping us at the top of their consideration set. So uh, the, the, the incompatibility, the mismatch is very frightening because flights are not uh, while people are. So uh, should we start? Can we handle that? I think we can. All right, very positive. Okay, the next question is, given we are expecting that there will not be a significant expected recovery until October or later, what more should the government do to support the tourism industry workers? Is it reasonable to expect the resorts to support their workers for six months while they remain closed? Uh, Anyone of you? Yes. Yeah, I, maybe I can have a, I can give some answers to this. Yes, please. Uh, Khalil, yeah. you can. Yeah. yeah, one thing that I wanted to highlight uh, on top of what Murad has said is basically uh, to open up the research. Yes, we are ready to open from 1st of July, but I think government need to look, relook at how we're going to open up the research. Instead of basically opening all the resource together, I would suggest basically stagger the resource opening and ask for voluntary delay in certain resource to open in order and give certain incentive for them basically not to open on 1st of July, rather push it back to September, October or November or the later part of this year. So this basically will help us to meet the kind of a demand and supply. If we open all the resource together, what's going to happen is there is going to be huge, you know, price competition which is going to happen and then nobody is going to win here. Neither the government nor the private sector will win because we're going basically dump the price like anything and then the GST component, the revenue that government is going to get is going to be half of what they're going to get if we really don't have that kind of a competition. So I would suggest basically government to start initiating and have a dialogue with the resorts in order to defer certain resources to open at a later time, not to open all the resorts together. Going back to this, uh, the staff, I think the uh, that's a very difficult question to answer. Some of the people, you know, we've been basically told that over the years, most of the civil society basically have been made to believe that no sooner resorts are ready and open from the day one, they are very cash rich. The idea of resorts are all swimming in a cash is not really correct. They are not really plucking the money from the tree that is basically being grown on, a, on the resort itself. The industry has been through a very tough, I would say, last couple of years, even before this uh, crisis. And there is, again, a huge competition due to certain explosion in the destination inventory. So that's basically one thing that I wanted to highlight. The best basically would have, but the scenario has already gone. If the government would have taken a proper action way back in February, in March, where they could basically wave off the rain for the resorts in order to, to mitigate the kind of a redundancy that we may have seen across different resorts, they would have basically got an assurance that to keep those, uh, the least rain money to retain the staff. So. I think uh, uh, we will basically have to look at how we can really manage. I don't think that anybody really wanted to fire anybody at any time because most of these people have been working with certain companies for a very long time. But uh, it's not really possible for anyone to continually to retain the employees uh, without basically having receive uh, any revenue for so long. Example, basically, the everywhere else in the world, the redundancy is happening. It's not only limited to Maldives alone. You look at the example of uh, Richard Branson, who basically has a Virgin Island. He has basically filed bankruptcy and requested a state to rec rescue. That basically proves that no business is basically shock free from this uh, uh, crisis so everybody is in deep trouble but we ha we can come out if we have a proper constructive dialogue between private sector and if we introduce a proper 
realistic stimulus packages in order to keep the employment level high. That's the key thing. We need urgently to raise the capital. We need to in basically, government must uh, borrow the money from abroad and at a lower rate, then redistribute that with the margin to private sector where government can earn a profit by lending those money to the private sector to stay, to keep the economy going. This is only the way that I can see to avoid this economic, this potential economic disaster that we're going to face within the next few months. All right. Thank you very much. I think we have come to an end uh, on the deliberations today. It has been, the time is never enough. We have gone beyond our 90 minute uh, schedule that we programmed. Uh, we are almost uh, up to the um, evening prayer time. Uh, so um, I think uh, we will try to conclude our first edition today. It has been very useful. Uh, the bottom line here is that uh, the Health Protection Agency is, uh, um, the Maldives is still under a national state of health emergency. Uh, so we have to follow the um, instruction and guidelines coming out from the Health Protection Agency. It is a must that we follow the guidelines set up by the HPA and the Director General of Health uh, Services. Um, secondly, um, the Ministry of Tourism is doing a lot of work engaging the um, stakeholders. So I think uh, continuing the collective effort with the private sector and the important stakeholders in the industry and listening to all of us, I think that would help us to come out uh, positively out of this situation. Our engagement today, I am sure, um, uh, a lot of questions that were unanswered before we started. Uh, before 4.30 p.m. today, I think a lot of, um, you know, misconceptions, a lot of, uh, you know, doubts, fears that we had in our mind and uh, in, in the, in so on several fronts, including the employers and the employees, I hope uh, what we did today here in this discussion would uh, contribute um, as, uh, you know, some kind of uh, response to those fears or questions that you might have had till now. We will summarize our discussion, we will prepare a small report, make it available on our website, and uh, we also have given our um, um, email address, uh, which is um, secretariat at nfme.mb. You could send any further questions to our panelists to, or our team of experts, and we would be happy to mail back with the answers. Uh, uh, we will not uh, doubt the scientific evidence or you know the science that is uh, there in front of us but as industry experts we will definitely you know work together to uh, you know work together to make this country a better place from the private sector we will support we will complement with all that is being done by the minister of tourism and and his excellency the president we we are fully behind uh, what the government is doing and uh, as the National Federation of Employers and the President and EXCO, what we are doing here is to only complement what the government is doing. So um, we, we, will, we will be there for you. We will be there for everyone. And uh, I hope that uh, we have contributed uh, to the society, to the industry and to the country in whatever small, small way we can. Thank you very much. Gias, thank you very much, Sonu. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Murad. Uh, very, very interesting. You know, uh, I have I have enriched myself uh, uh, today. You know, um, I, I live a better person. Um, I'm also an investor and you know stakeholder in the tourism industry. Maybe many of you do not know that, uh, although I, I'm regarded as a contractor, as a builder. But then we also I also have our own stakes in the industry. So I think um, I speak from the heart. For the industry just like all of you and, and thank you very much for all those um, participants you know we had over um, you know 60 participants from the beginning to the end which means the enthusiasm has been there and um, uh, on facebook live we had about 30,000 watching us so um appreciate your appreciate your um, patience and uh, we have seven more episodes on various industries. So the next one is on 10th July, same time on the construction industry. 
uh, looking forward uh, to have uh, all of you. And uh, if we made a mistake, if we had, you know, something that wasn't, right, if you said something that wasn't right, we would love to have your feedback. Once again, thank you very much. And please expect uh, you, the Federation, National Federation, to do more exciting things. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.